Well, thank you. Thank you, Bud, and members of the band. Precious worship time. Praise God for it. I'm speaking to you today on God the Creator. Paul often begins his sermons to the Jews in the synagogues, and that's mostly where he would go to preach, is in the synagogues when he would go to a town. He would begin his sermons with the promises of the Old Testament and the coming of the Messiah and how that Jesus of Nazareth was that Messiah. For example, Acts 17, 2 and 3, Paul went to the synagogues and as was his custom, for three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer and die and rise from the dead. And then he would say, and this Jesus is the Messiah. So those are the two big things he would do with the Jews. He would use the scripture, which they all believed the scripture, the Jewish synagogues, that's why they were there. And they believed in a coming Messiah. But the two things they did not believe was the Messiah had to be crucified. And the second thing is they didn't believe Jesus was that Messiah. So he used the scripture to prove those two things. Now, when he would speak to Gentiles, he took a different approach. Gentiles didn't have Bibles. They didn't read them. They did have one. They didn't really care about Jesus or whether he was the Messiah or not, had nothing to do with them. So when Paul went to an open air meeting, a marketplace of Gentiles, he would preach on creation. He would start with creation. For example, in that same chapter in Acts 17, verse 23, he's speaking to the Athenians out in the open air. He said, What you worship is unknown, I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in these idolatrous temples that you've made. And he's not served by human hands like he needs anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In other words, when Paul goes to Gentiles who didn't have Scripture and they didn't believe in the Messiah, he would start with creation. And he would start with God the Creator, not Jesus the Savior. Now we are fast approaching a society that is much like the Gentiles of Paul's day. They don't read the scripture and they don't really think about Jesus the Messiah. They are not even sure about creation. So I want to uh, give to you, uh, just begin here by pointing out three things the evolutionists cannot explain. And then why it matters that we proclaim creation and the creator. But there are three things the evolutionist has not been able, and I don't think ever will be able to explain. Number one is the origins of life. Where does life come from? I mean, it's not like a tree which has no life in the sense of human life. The scientific American 
magazine in 2018 said, advances in astronomy, science, and chemistry now hold promise that answers to such a profound question as the origin of life may be just around the corner. And I read that and I thought, you know, when the theory of evolution by Darwin started in 1850, this is 170 years later, and they're still saying answers to the origin of life may be just around the corner. They need to get a different corner. After 170 years, they still don't know. And they have theories. How did life begin? Evolution's one thing, but life. Theories include lightning strikes, maybe uh, some kind of lightning strike a billion years ago, pressures in the ocean. And one view that's gaining ground, seems absurd, but is that aliens dumped their garbage here on earth millions of years ago. And that, you know, when you have a garbage can, sometimes little worms start crawling. Where'd, do, where'd life come from? So the view is aliens dump their bacteria-laden garbage and over enough time, you had worms, you had creatures, and voila, you have us. <laughs> You're, you emerge from a garbage dump. Now actually, uh, one professor already has a plan. They want to repopulate the universe by sending our garbage to planets which have no people. And so they, one, one uh, professor, Claudius Gross of Frankfurt, Germany, has a 50-year plan to repopulate, repopulate the planet or the other planets with garbage from the earth. He calls it Genesis. Well, the bottom line is they have no, really, no idea. It's called the theory of evolution for a reason. It's not, it's a theory. So 1 Timothy 6.20 says, Timothy, keep what's been committed to you. Avoid these profane, vain babblings and the opposition and contradictions that come from that which is falsely called science. See, this isn't science. This is stupidity. But there are three things I said that the evolutionists cannot explain. One is life. Where did life come from? Here's a second one. Motion. Where did the first movement begin? Where is the unmoved mover? Lightning has to have a movement. Did you know everything moves? Everything in existence moves. The universe is moving. It's moving outward. Uh, our, our solar system is revolving. Even the sun revolves. If you, if you went down to the very cells and atomic structure of your body, an atom is made up of three things, a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And they are little, they are three little entities just moving around each other, orbiting each other. Everything moves. Where did movement come from? What started the movement and the motion? A third thing that they cannot explain, and I don't think ever will, is what, where did matter come from or existence, being? How can a thing 
be rather than not be. How can this table and chairs be rather than not be? Well, somebody made them. But they cannot explain where substance or being originally come from because you always have to back up. They always have to start with something. What's the original substance that was never created? And they can't figure that out. So basically their view is nothing plus nobody produced everything and everybody. But if you have a Bible, you can open up a Bible and find the origins of your being. Genesis 1, 6, God said, let there be a firmament. Genesis 1, 14, let there be lights, sun, moon, and stars in the firmament. Genesis 1, 29, this shall be for food, he said to Adam and Eve. But the evolutionist, the pagan mind, cannot explain the origins of life, the origins of motion, and the origin of being or existence. Ultimately, you can't get to that from a pagan mindset. Life, motion, and matter or being. But a third grader who's a Christian and has a Bible can pick up their Bible. Look at uh, Acts 17, verse 26 to 28. Acts 17, 26 to 28. And he made from one man every nation of mankind. Amen. God made up everybody to live on the face of the earth, having determined the designated periods of their life and the boundaries of their dwelling in order that they would seek God. He put you here so you'd know Him. Now notice this, Acts 17, 28. For in Him... We live, oh, the origins of life. In Him we live. He gave us life. In Him we move, ah, motion. And in Him we have our being, our existence, our substance. The three things you can never find in a pagan textbook the Bible lays out for you as a Christian is life, motion, and existence. And God is at the core of all three of those. So we can move on, see. We can move on and settle other issues. I know why I'm here. I know how I can move. And I know why things work. I know why my environment functions with rhythm. And you are the result. Here's what one man said. And I'm quoting, you're the result of a fortuitous concourse of atoms. <laughs> there you go. Now you know who you are. A fortuitous concourse of atoms. You're just a cross current of chemicals that is spewing and brewing with an existence or life that is meaningless. And just passing with time. If God didn't create you. I want to proclaim creation today. And God the creator today. And I want to tell each of you, especially our young people. You are divinely created. You are wonderfully designed. And you are passionately loved. By the God of heaven. Amen. Just receive that. Take that in. 
You are not an accident, but God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But if creation's not true, if we evolved, and where's all that go? Where does meaning go? Where does purpose go? Here's a third thing. If God has created all things and puts breath in our bodies, we can trust Him even with an uncertain future. Amen. See, if He created, if He can bring things into existence that were not in existence, Something you hadn't thought of. Something that couldn't be anticipated. Well, give your future to Him. Because He can create things. Out of nothing. He doesn't even need help. I don't know of anybody here that helped Him in Genesis 1. 1 Peter 4.19 says, let therefore those who suffer according to God's will entrust their lives to a faithful creator. See, we're giving ourselves to a faithful creator. He's faithful. He's a creator. What a place to put your future into. We can entrust him with the uncertainty of a future. We were going to church Wednesday night and Jan was driving and uh, she's she's got a six-speed manual shift six-speed and as we were going to church she started talking about politics and um, the more she talked the madder she got and the madder she got the worse she drove she was like, mm, mm, and I'll tell you another thing, mm, weaving through the car. I said, honey, if you don't quit talking about politics, you're going to kill us both. Corey Ten Boom put it this way. She said, if you look around, you'll be distressed. If you look within, You'll be depressed. But if you look above to Him, you'll be at rest. Amen. If He's the Creator and He's on His throne and He rules His world and sustains it by wise providence, then we can entrust to a faithful Creator the future and uncertainty of it. Then one final thing. If God's a creator, isn't this an encouragement to pray? Oh, man. Love this verse. If God's a creator, Jeremiah 33, 2 and 3. Thus says the Lord who made the earth. He formed it and established it. The Lord is His name. Call to me. I will answer thee. And I will show you or tell you of great and hidden things that you have not known. See, there's, there's things you haven't anticipated. There's solutions you haven't foreseen. God says, I'm the creator. Notice how he starts out to Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah here in this, if you read verse 1, he's in prison. He's been locked up, unjustly, treated, mistreated. Now what? God speaks to him in his imprisonment. And those weren't prisons like we have today in America. Those were dry cisterns with mud at the bottom where you could sink. God says, Jeremiah... 
I am the Lord that made the heavens and the earth and established it. Call on me. I will answer thee. I'm going to show you some things that are hidden that you haven't even thought of. See, that is our invitation today. That's what God is saying. If God is creator, if it's a pagan mindset and everything evolved, then there's no hope. There's no hope for anything except what you can scratch together with your own solution skills and efforts. But if there's a God in heaven who holds this world together and is the explanation of life and motion and being, then we can ask for the moon. Oh, how big our prayers can be. We don't have to accept defeat. Ephesians 2.10, Paul said, He's created. You are, you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So you're created. Your condition that is depressing you, your bondage does not have to remain. You may call on a creator who creates. We are His workmanship created. When, when David had committed adultery and his heart was defiled and impure and guilty and his future was dismissed by the accusations of the enemy, he prayed in Psalm 51, O oh God, create a clean heart in me. Hallelujah! You know, your whole personality can change. There's nothing that can't change. The Creator has asked us, invited us to call on His name. He'll show us some things that we hadn't thought of. Amen. See, that's a, what a wonderful alternative to a pagan mindset. Those who believe in creation are a blessed people indeed. We'll close with a song. Are we going to do This Is My Father's World? If, all right. If we can do it, let's do it.